Yahweh bless you. Tonight we're going to do a teaching on the sheep are ruling the shepherds. And we'll get in, involved in that a little bit later. But right now we're going to hear from our Heavenly Father according to 1 Corinthians 14. Where Apostle Paul says, I would that you all speak in tongues, and rather that you prophesy, that the church may receive edifying. And if you're going to speak in tongues, I want you to interpret. So that's what we're going to do now to hear from our Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord Yahushua, for uh, pouring out on us Holy Ruach, that you made us holy, that we could receive that Holy Ruach, the Ruach HaKadosh. So uh, we will begin. And, and Father, we thank you for these words. So our Lord and Savior, Mashiach Yahushua. So anybody's inspired, go ahead. Don't back down when it comes to my word. Be bold. Because your number one objective is to be right standing in front of me. And if my children would all focus on that one thing, getting their life right, then the butterfly effect would, uh, would change more things than they could ever imagine. So don't turn your back from me in obedience to look at the people who are not obeying, but rather focus upon me and get your face right on me. And as you do so, the rest of the things will be taken care of. Oh, well, prophesy. Do not let yourself be backed into a corner like an animal. If you are backed in, you are going to lash out, and that is what your enemy is wanting. They are wanting you to lift up your arms and lash out at them so they can grab you by the, by the legs. Do not let yourself be swayed easily as you are backed into this corner. It's inevitable. You are going to be backed in. But you need to make a choice not to lash out out of fear, but out of righteous anger. Oh, I'll speak in tongues and interpret. Bukuliana eata satamea tu kutiata. Abiana ut biati kileana eatu kweata satamea ti keana. Ubutu kweati keatu biata. Be bold on your presentation. Be bold that you are my children, that I instilled power and ability and confidence. So be bold on presenting my son and myself to the world that they may see me abiding within you. Amen. Thank you, Father, for these words. So we will begin. Um, it's kind of an epiphany. So many times we're, I'm, I'm trying to understand how did things get to the way they are? And so really, this teaching is also on conforming or reforming. And so our ministry, what we're doing right now, is reformation, to reform. Uh, but we find out, why are trans Bible translations um, the way they are? And Bible translations are the way they are because publishers are going to publish saying that people will buy. So if the sheep are not going to buy them, they're not going to produce them. Very simple. So the sheep determine, not the pastors, uh, not the church, but basically the, the sheep determine what's going to be published. They don't want word Yahweh. It's, 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 you know, they don't want it in, their, in the Bible. So you can't get mad at the publishers. If they wanted Yahweh, if they wanted accuracy, they would demand it from the publishers, and the publishers just want to make money. And so we're going to find out uh, uh, the publishing companies will publish what sheep will purchase. Uh, the recording companies, you know, CDs, music, will produce what sheep will purchase. Uh, movies will produce what sheep will purchase. And so what we find out is instead of getting mad to me at the pastors or the problem or the pope or this person or that person, usually the head is the problem. And we find out usually it's not because the organization, what we call Christianity, is not run by certain heads. It's ran by the sheep, and which we will illustrate. And it's always been that way. Uh, the realization has been that way. So we will begin. <coughs> uh, sheep are calling the shots. Sheep, you know, as we saw, the sheep murdered their shepherds. And more and more, which were the prophets, uh, which was Yahushua. But we're going to see, this is just prophesied in Isaiah 6, chapter, chapter 6. And this is, it goes through all the New Testament, New Covenant. 
I'm sorry, did you say Isaiah? Isaiah chapter, chapter 6. <clears throat> And what we need to know that is we can't get, uh, uh, you know, deceived to think that people don't have the right information. When we present the right information, if they reject it, it's because they want to conform. They don't want the reformation. They want to conform. And here, here's just an example. So we go to a political lunch every Friday. And I've got a Rotherham Bible with me, which is, without a doubt, the most accurate English translation of the Word of Yahweh. And uh, these the Christians who are at our table are not interested. They're the sheep. I can tell them it's the most accurate Bible. It doesn't make any difference. They don't care about accuracy. So accuracy is secondary to tradition and for other things, what they want to believe. They want the King James, they want the New King James, you want the NIV, the New Living Translations, whatever's coming up there. That's what it is. So we've got to conf not confuse ourselves to say they w don't want accuracy. They don't want Yahweh. Very simply. And so Yahweh, if anybody knows it, Yahweh knows it. Who gave Yahweh his name? Yahweh did. Yahweh! It says it 6,800 times. Do they want it? No. They don't even want Jehovah. And that's not the publishers. Because the publishers produce the Rotherham. If people start buying the Rotherham in, in the capacity they did with the NIV and New Living Translation, everybody would be pop, uh, publishing it because it's out of copyright. And so there's money to be made. But it's not in demand and it will never usually be in demand. But Isaiah 6, chapter 6, verse 9. <clears throat> Then said he, Go and say unto this people, Hear on, but do not discern. See on, but do not perceive. Stupefied thou the heart of this people, and their ears make thou heavy, and their eyes overspread, lest they see with their eyes, and with their ears should hear, and their hearts should discern, and come back, and they be healed. Where were you reading? Yeah, uh, six, Isaiah nine. 6, 9. Did oh, I say they, 9? I thought you said 6, 6. Sorry. Okay. 6, 9 through 10. Okay. We can also see this in Matthew 13, 13. The repeating of this. So a good point is the people can be good. So let me make a distinction here. These people I eat with are good people. They're not breaking the most of the commandments. You know, with the Trinity, you're going to break the first and second commandment. If you don't obey the Trinity, you're making the first and second commandment. These are not Democrats who break at least five additional commandments. So that would be seven out of the ten Christians vote or, or vote. So, but most of these people who are Trinitarians, who are going to believe the things I'm going to show you, will give to missions and they want people to be delivered in, in the way that they think it should be done. So we have to say that we have a history full of people doing good things. Uh, John Newton, who did Amazing Grace, and, and we're going to see over and over and over, they did good things, but not in the capacity they're supposed to. And they, they conformed to society rather than reforming, because reforming is very difficult. And, and why you can say that is we're in a city of 300,000 people. You know, we got five people here. You know, so that's all there is. That's it. People don't want it. And most of our own own family don't want it. I want to exaggerate a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's even, it's even sad. <laughs> so you even have it where our, our only family members will turn away. Really simple. I always say really simple. It's not. Matthew 13, 13. On page 13. Uh, through 17. Now watch this. And then here's that right. 13, 13 through 17. No, that's not right. Uh -oh. Three? Do you want me to read it? No, that's not right. Seeing that. They, no, no, no. Oh, where do you read it? 13, 13, or 12. No, 13, 13. Matthew? Oh, I'm on 14. <clears throat> okay. I was looking over here. You made a mistake. Okay, yeah. Oh, there we go. So I'm like, that's not even close. 
<laughs> Here we go. I thought, how could I be so wrong? <laughs> Thank God I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Second one. For this reason, in parables unto them do I speak, because seeing what they say not. So the people I have lunch with, they say them, they don't, they don't see. Hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And again is being fulfilled in them the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, They shall surely hear, and yet will not understand, and surely see, and yet not perceive. And another example, the people we have lunch with, they're not interested in speaking in tongues. They're not interested in prophesying. They're not interested in tongues of interpretation. And just completely contrary to what we're going to be covering. And I thought how sad that is because these people with Christ right here at the table are rejecting the will of their master. And they're wonderful people. Yeah, and they, they do good. It's just they're not going to go here. And surely see and yet not perceive, for the heart of this people have become dense, and with their ears heavily have they heard, and their eyes have they closed, lest once they should see with their eyes, and with their ears should hear, and with their hearts should understand and return, when I could certainly heal them. But the good point is us, but happy are your eyes that they see, and your ears that they hear. For verily I say unto you, many prophets and righteous men have coveted to see what you see and have not seen, and to hear what you hear and have not heard. Praise Yahweh for that. But we've got people like the Rotherham or Companion Bibles that have expressed that, and the publishing companies like Craigle. Uh, and we're going no matter what, at Reformation. <clears throat> now we go to uh, the First Corinthians 1. And we're, are we going this back is also. To, are we going back to Isaiah? No. First Corinthians one. I think we think of the Puritans leaving Europe. Yeah. Not but it's to... still the 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 the, um, the foundation of the teaching is the sheep are in charge. So just remember that it's not the pastors. And this is illustrated one twelve, First Corinthians one twelve. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying what? I, I am being of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am a Cephas, but I am of Christ. Right there. They're choosing who they're going to follow. Now you go over to uh, 3, verse 1 through 4. I therefore, brethren, have not been able to speak unto you as unto men of the Ruach, but as unto men of the flesh, as unto babes in Christ. With milk have I fed you, not with me, nor not yet have you been able. Nay, not even even now are you able, for you are yet fleshly. And whereas there are among you jealousies and strife, are you not fleshly and after the manner of men walking? Now, are these good people? Yeah, the Corinthians church are good people. And he's just laying it out. Here's what you guys are. So we're looking at the same people. Uh, you're fleshly. But as soon as one began to say, I am of a Paul, for I am of Luther, another I am of Paulus, I am of Calvin. Are you not men? So that is the sheep declaring what they're going to do. We go into uh, Galatians 4. And here's Paul. And that was Paul there too, just laying it out. This is just the facts of life. 4.16. And we know they want to be circumcised. The Galatians who are uh, nations, or non and the word Hebrew is Ibri. And so we're so far off, it's really I-B-R-I. That's the, that's the actual word. Hebrew. So how we got Hebrew, I have no idea, but we're going to try to correct that. It's Ibri, or Ibris. Uh, and so they were not Ibris. Uh, these were uh, Gentiles, or nations, or non Ibris. And they're going back to circumcision. They wanted to go to back to the Levitical law. 16. So then, and who's doing that? Well, that's the sheep. The sheep are going, pushing another avenue. So then your enemies have I become by dealing truthfully with you. And that's what happens when you, when you tell the truth. 
to people many times with Christian circles, you'll become their enemies by telling them the truth. And that was the Apostle Paul's walk. Finish reading that. Well, no. 17 is part of what you're talking about. No, that's all right. Let's go to 2 Timothy 1, verse 15. I'm sorry, what did you say? 2 Timothy 1, 15. So here's the Apostle Paul <coughs> leading these masses. But he didn't tell them what they wanted to hear. And so if you have a diner that's very good food, and people don't want very healthy food, you know what's going to happen to your diner? It's going to close. Because the, the people don't want healthy food. If I open a, a pastry or a donut shop or ice cream shop, that's what they want. And so Paul's opening up a health food store. And, and why? Look right here. In uh, 15, thou know, this is to Timothy, thou knowest this, that all they who are in, are in Asia have turned away from me. Think of that. That's the Ephesian church. Now, all of the Asia has turned away from me. And why are they doing this? Go to chapter 4, verse 2. And this is for all of us and for the leaders. And so on our Tellulose Ministries, whoever does view this, you know, we have about 350 visitors to our website every day. So it's about 12 to 13,000 people throughout the world you know, 30 different countries plus that are going to our website. So there are reformers out there. Now, whether they t take and go with it or not, it's up to them, but it's not dead by any means. Uh, but 4.2, proclaim the word to Timothy. Take that position in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, encourage, with all long suffering and teaching. And here's what it's all about. For there will be a season... When the helpful teaching, who are they? Sheep. The sheep. The helping teaching they will not endure, but according to their what? Own coveting. Own covetings. Donuts. That's where it's at. <laughs> I want donuts. Or I want cocaine. I want you know, I want Sex. fornication. You know, I want I want three gods, which we're gonna see. It will unto them heap up teachers, and so guess what? There's a void, and so you know, the people, the business owners can say, okay, these people don't want health food. They want donuts. Well, and I'll open up a donut shop. And it will heap up teachers because they have itching ear. And from the truth indeed their ear will they turn away, while unto stories they will turn themselves aside. And that we're going to show you a history of that. And here's just an example. Example. Martin Luther was a reformist, and we actually call it the Reformation. Martin Luther, a granddaughter goes to a Catholic school, so they know about the Reformation. The reason she goes is because it's a private school. We don't have a good Protestant private school. All we have is public schools or Catholic, so we choose that. But this is a compendium of Luther's theology. So this is a translation. Obviously, he's German. And we're going to see what he, what he was teaching on death. And then we're going to see what his present church, the Lutheran church, is now teaching on death. So they're not even following Luther. <clears throat> Thus we should learn to view our death in the right light, so that we need not become alarmed on account of it, as unbelief does, because in Christ it is indeed not death, but a fine, sweet, and brief sleep which brings us release from this veil of tears, from sin and from the fear and extremities of real death, and from all the misfortunes of this life. And we shall be secure without care, rest sweetly and gently for a brief moment, as on a sofa, until the time when he shall call and awaken us together with all his dear children to his eternal glory and hope. For since we call it a sleep, we know that we shall not remain in it, but again awaken and live, and that the time during which we sleep shall seem no longer than if we had just fallen asleep. Hence we shall censor ourselves that we are surprised or alarmed at such a sleep in the hour of death, and suddenly come alive out of the grave and from decomposition, 
and entirely well, fresh with a pure, clear, glorious life, meet our Lord and Savior, Yahush, or Jesus Christ, in the clouds. And uh, scriptures everywhere afford such consolation, which speak of the death of the saints if they fell asleep. We did that with Lazarus. We did that with Stephen. We were talking about all the prophets of David. And were gathered to their fathers. That is, hath overcome death through their, this faith and comfort in Christ and await the resurrection together with the saints who precede them in death. Therefore, the early Christians... Uh, undoubtedly from the apostles or disciples, followed the custom of bringing their dead to honorable burial and wherever possible and turn them in separate places which they call not places of burial or graveyards, but cemeteries. So cemetery means sleeping chamber or dormitory, which is houses of sleep, names that have remained to us until our time. Wow. Now, that's Martin Luther, oh, 1500s. Now, this is Martin Luther, uh, Dr. A. L. Berry, president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Snod. What is death? And this is an article about death and dying. How many years is the difference, you think? Is it 1,500 to now. You know, the Bible teaches, now this is great authority, so always be aware of that. Most people's statement of beliefs state, we believe the Bible, and only information that comes from the Bible. Next statement, there are three gods, <laughs> a triune God. What chapter or verse? You just broke your first statement immediately. This is ridiculous. What is death? The Bible teaches that death is not an annihilation to which we cease to exist. The scriptures teach that death is a separation of our eternal soul, no place we found, from our mortal bodies. Our bodies rest in the grave, away in the final days when soul and body shall be reunited. At the moment of death, our soul, souls and the souls of all those who died in faith immediately are in the presence of Christ and will enjoy his presence, peace and joy until the great day of the resurrection of all flesh. Completely counters what Luther taught and what the word teaches. Because now it's all saying death is our friend. What happens after we die? For unbelievers, this is the second death, Revelations 20, 14, in which their souls are immediately in the presence of Satan and immediately begin to suffer the torment of eternal punishment in hell from where there is no possibility of escape. On the day of judgment, their bodies join their souls in hell. <laughs> like, and uh, now it's really going to get bad, right? <laughs> You've just been tortured for thousands of years. What the hell cares about your body? You know, so it comes down to, but this is what the Bible teaches. Yeah, right. But that it shows you a complete contradiction of what... The sheep. Yeah, of sheep wanting... Itching ears. They want to, to, to go to heaven after they die. So, let me just show you an illustration. And that's called confirmation bias. So here's just some examples. People, as we're going to see, have always wanted multiple gods. It's just history, multiple gods. So we want multiple gods. Okay, so we got a verse for you, Matthew 28, 19. I'm going to quote this from the King James. We'll give you multiple gods. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Three gods right there. Well, wait a minute here. But we reject Deuteronomy 6, 4, 4. Hero Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. And so what I've got to do is, the Old Covenant's really a problem. And so we're just going to act like that doesn't even exist. And so you're going to see yeah. the new, these new things. Is just forget about all that. And that's why we can't have Yahweh, because it makes a big mess. Because now I can't say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right? Because Yahweh's got a name, his son Yahushua has a name, and the Holy Spirit doesn't have a name. And now we're getting into a really problem here, so let's just get rid of that. Next thing they want. We want to go to heaven upon death. I got a verse for you. 2 Corinthians 5, 8. We are confident, yes, well-pleasing, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. See, when you die, you're absent from the body and present with the Lord. Another one, too. 
it says we're going to be, you know, and that means we have to have two different things at least because my body's dead, I know that. Well, what is gone to the Lord? Well, we've got to come up with another piece of uh, being that we have. Well, that is 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And now the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body good. Now we got spirit, soul, and body. Man is three parts. Uh, obviously Moses didn't know about this. News to him. Be served blameless at the coming of our Lord Yahushua Mashiach. Well, the problem is, you want to go to heaven upon death, you have to throw out all of 1 Corinthians 15. That talks about the resurrection. You have to throw out first the first Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. So you completely, those do not confirm my bias. So I've got to push those aside. I want to grab a verse that confirms what I want to believe. So these are the verses that do it. Next one is, we also don't want to speak in tongues. Real simple. What verse can we do to use that? Oh, here we go. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Aha. Uh -huh. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Aha. Uh -huh. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away. Okay, these have all been done away. Now, because I don't, that's confirmation bias, I don't want to speak in tongues. But then the next chapter says, Yeah, 1 Corinthians 14, 5, How be it I wish you all to speak with tongues, but rather that you be prophesying. Well, that just undid everything that I wanted to do. How about 39, So then my brother be zealous to prophesy, do not, uh, not be, do not forbid to be speaking with tongues. 1 Thessalonians 5, Quench not the spirit, do not despise prophesying, you know. And so this is called confirmation bias that we find out that people, what they want to believe, they'll grab a verse. And here's just three different occurrences, uh, and, but it completely contradicts all the other verses so that those scriptures are not meaning what they're saying they're meaning. Because as you know, with the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, they never baptized in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's called confirmation bias. So we see that the sheep are leading the shepherds. And, you know, I don't know if we even need to go there. Well, let's just do that. Exodus 32 with Aharon. Great example. If anybody should be able to keep the sheep in, um, in order, it should be Aharon or Aaron. Okay, one through six. Uh, when do you want to read that? And when the people saw that Moses was delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, oh, make for us gods, who shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we know not what hath befallen him. Now, wait a minute, who's saying this? The sheep. People. The sheep. people. The sheep. The sheep are in charge. Go ahead. Two. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the rings of gold which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people of themselves break off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received the gold at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it a molten calf, and they said, these are thy gods, O Israel, who brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, A festival to Yahweh tomorrow. So they rose up early on the morrow and offered ascending sacrifices and brought near and offered ascending sacrifices, brought near peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to make sport. There you go. So... <laughs> that's always the way it is really simple it's not unusual it's all just differences Aaron or Aharon conformed instead of reforming wow. very simple he conformed instead of reformed and that's what the pastors today many of them go in initially to help Christ they believe that they're called and maybe they are called 
that at some particular time, whether they take the Reformation way, the Reform way, which is the easy way or the hard way? The hard way. The hard way. They will take the confirmation or conform rate. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to avoid anything that the sheep don't want or that makes the sheep uncomfortable. And so that makes the sheep, instead of me telling the sheep what Yahweh says, many times I'm, which I do intermingle what they allow me to bring in, but what they don't want me to allow in, I keep silent on yeah. that particular point. Now we go to Judges 2. We'll just go through the little history here of the same um, pattern. Nothing new. So we're talking about thousands of years. Same old, same old. Judges uh, 2 7. And the people served Yahweh all the days of Yahushua. And all the elders of, and all the days of the elders who outlived Yahushua, who had seen all the great works of Yahweh which he had wrought for Israel. Okay, we had a period of time. You know, uh, Yahushua or Joshua was a reformist. He kept things reformed. But as we look at verse ten and thirteen, all the generations also were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who had not known Yahweh, nor even the work which he had wrought for Israel. So the sons of Israel did the thing that was wicked in the eyes of the sight of Yahweh, and they served the Baals. So remember, it's always multiple gods. Just always think about that. And that's a trend. It's just right in norm. It's just right in there. And they forsook Yahweh, the God, the Elohim of their fathers, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt and went after other gods, plural, from among the gods of the people who were round about them and bowed themselves down unto them and angered Yahweh. They conformed to their environment. We go to Judges 3, 7. And let's just go through the book of Judges. Melania, read 3, 7. <clears throat> Three seven. Thus did the sons of Yis thus did the sons of Israel the thing that was wicked in the sight of Yahweh and forgot Yahweh their Elohim, and served the Baals and Asher uh, Asheros. Asheros. Here we go. This is the whole story all the way through. Uh, verse twelve. And the sons of Israel again did the thing that was wicked in the sight of Yahweh, and Yahweh emboldened. Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they did the thing that was wicked in the sight of Yahweh. Okay, let's go to 4 verse 1. And the sons of Israel again did the thing that was wicked in the sight of Yahweh when Ehu was dead. And so their leaders who were reformists, they reformed and they usually ruled with a strong hand like Moses. When they died, the sheep took over again. The sheep took over again. And uh, six one. So he's going through all the different judges of Israel. Here's Gideon. And the sons of Israel did the thing that was wicked in the eyes sight of Yahweh. So Yahweh delivered them up into the hands of Midian seven years. Ten verse six. <coughs> and the sons of and I'll tell you what. The people, when they got their religious framework that they were living in, in that community, to them and their children, that was the right religious framework. Was it right? No, it wasn't right. It was what, it was what Satan and other people brought in. Uh, six, ten, six, and the sons of Israel again did the thing that was wicked in the sight of Yahweh and served the Baals and Asherahs and the gods of Assyria and the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the sons of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines that forsook Yahweh and served him not. Uh, thirteen, verse one. So we should never be surprised. Here is Samson and the sons of Israel again did the thing that was wicked in the sight of Yahweh. So Yahweh delivered them in the hands of the Philistine 40 years. And now remember, Samuel was a judge, one of the last judges, 1 Samuel 7, chapter 7, verse 3 to 4. 
chapter 7. <coughs> yeah. First Samuel chapter 7. This is after the ark was taken. Hotney and Phineas were uh, wicked. You know, Eli did not. Uh, he, that was me. So Eli didn't reprove them. And they, the Philistines got the Ark of the Covenant. It vanishes for 20 years. Let's just go into verse 2. And so it was that from the day the Ark came to dwell in Kiras Jerem, the days multiplied it and became 20 years, and all the house of Israel went mourning after Yahweh. 20 years. Samuel's waiting for people to turn around. And here's Samuel. And Samuel spake unto the house of Israel, saying, if with all your heart you are returning unto Yahweh, then put away the gods of the foreigner out of your midst. Look at that, you're right there. But Samuel and the Asteros, and firmly set your heart towards Yahweh and serve him alone. Look at that, serve Yahweh alone. You ask any Christian, who do you serve? And they're not going to say Yahweh. Jesus. Yeah, they're going to say Jesus, or they're going to say God. Well, what God are you serving? Uh, and so we're so ill-equipped and serve him alone and he may deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the sons of Israel did what? Put away the Baals and Astros and serve Yahweh alone. Same, it's the same story as of today. We go to 1 Kings 11. You know, David did a good job. And then, you know, as we know, Solomon did a good job most of his life. But 1 Kings 11 tells us another picture. And I'm just going to go through 4, verse 8. Yeah, it came to pass in, in the old age of Solomon. I don't know how many years that would be. It might be in the last five years. or uh, You served 40 years. But something, or it might have been 10. But, and his wives turned aside his heart after other gods. His heart, therefore, were not sound with Yahweh his God, as was the heart of David his father. And Solomon went after Asherah, goddess of the Zeldonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Amorites. Thus Solomon did the thing that was wicked in the eyes of Yahweh, and went not fully after Yahweh as David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemish, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abominations of the sons of Ammon. And thus did he do all his foreign wives who burn incense and offer sacrifice unto their gods. We go to 1 Kings 12, and this is Jeroboam, verse 36. Or 26, sorry. Next transition, so the ten tribes were taken away from uh, Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And Yahweh anointed Jeroboam, and it should be Jeroboam with a Y instead of a J. So just remember, anytime you see a J, put a Y in its place. And, and what we're going to see. Now, the problem is with, with Jeroboam is, as we all know, there are three feast days that everybody's supposed to go back to Jerusalem. And so he, he starts, which we're going to find out, that was law, Mosaic law. So he says, if they go back to Jerusalem, let's just see what happens. Verse 26, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David, if these people go up to offer sacrifice in the house of Yahweh in Jerusalem. Then will the heart of this people return unto their Lord, unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will slay me and return unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and it's not Judah, it's Judah. Whereunto the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. Here we go, back to the same situation. <coughs> that's, what, that's what the God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit is. These are the sins of Rehoboam that we're living in right now. And said unto them, Is it too much for you to go up to Jerusalem? Lo, thy gods of Israel that brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Are these people no difference? Did they yeah, know? Yeah, they knew. Yeah, they knew. They been, their, their grandfather, their father, has been going up to Jerusalem, and their great-grandfather, for three feast days every year. <clears throat> but it was a long walk. So 
Israel. So sometimes from Nazareth, it's a three-day walk. Well, let's just do something about that. We don't like that walk. And so these people, the sheep, are not going to say, oh, did you get another revelation from like Moses did, and now the law has changed? No, they're just going to go. He just gave them what the sheep want. 29, and he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin, and the people went up before the one as far as Dan. And he made a house of high places, and made priests from the whole compass of the people, who were not of the sons of Levi. That's what people wanted. Uh, you have two gods. Dan is north, closer to you guys. Bethel is south, closer to you guys. Everybody's got proximity, no problem. Maybe a one-day walk, okay. And Jeroboam made a festival. You know, the festival was always the seventh month. Yeah. And Jeroboam made a festival in the eighth month, on um, the fifteenth day of the month, like the festival which was held in Judah, and offered upon the altar. Likewise did he in Bethel, sacrifice to the calves which he had made, and he kept in attendance in Bethel the priests of the high place which he had made. There you go. He just gave the people what he wanted, what they wanted, and that's the majority of, of, of the tribe of Israel. You know, two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, stayed in, you know, in, uh, with Rehoboam. The other 10, which you're looking at, that's 80% that have separated themselves from Yahweh. Are they religious? The king that was... That yeah. was anointed. Yeah, by. anointed by Yahweh. Are they are they uh, religious? Yes, they're doing their holy days. Uh, they're going to their altars. They're doing a setting sacrifice, just like no different than today. It really comes down to it. It's just because we were immersed into it. To us, this is normal. There is no Yahweh. I was never raised with Yahweh or Yahushua. I was raised with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, the people when they die, they go to heaven. And so we're, we're just in a, in a pagan culture that we open this book <coughs> like Josiah did and say, wait a minute, those are lies. Mm -hmm. Those were what the customs, those were the people that did to conform. They conformed instead of reformed. <coughs> now we go to Nehemiah 13, where it's now, you know, Jerusalem has been taken away. You know, after I think 300 and some years, so we're talking about between Moses and probably this time, you know, you might be talking about 700, 800 years. The United States is like 200, over 200 years old. We're talking about 700 years of the same thing over and over and over again. 484. What chapter? 13, right? Okay, wait a minute. Nehemiah 13, 23 through 27. Want to read that in? Would you read that and say that again? 13, yep. 27. Thank you. 13, 23 through 27. Okay. Go ahead. I'm waiting for it. She'll catch up. Moreover, in those days saw I the youths who had married women of Ashdod, of Ammon, of Moab, and their children were one half speaking the language of Ashdod and understood not how to speak the language of the Jews. Uh, but after the tongue of both people, so I contended with them and I laid a curse upon them and I smelt them uh, from among them, certain men, and pulled out their, their hair. And I put them un, on oath by Elohim. Okay, stop here. Is he a reformer? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Is he reforming? Is yeah. he is he conforming? No. No, he is not conforming. Ezra is the same way. He didn't conform either. Pulling people's hair out, hitting them with sticks, whatever. I mean, this, you do this in your church? Okay. <laughs> now, proceed. Uh, you shall, you not, shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take of their daughters for your sons, nor for yourselves. Was it not over these things that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Though among many nations there was no king such as he, and he was beloved by his Elohim. And so Elohim gave him to be king over all of Israel. Even him did foreign wives cause to sin. Unto you then shall we hearken to do all this great wickedness to act unfaithfully with our Elohim by marrying foreign wives. That's it. So that, that it goes back to Nehemiah. It goes right into it. And we see the same thing when Christ came. 
But, you know, we don't have to go there. But who is accused of killing Christ? Israelites. The sheep. <laughs> on, on a holy day. Yeah. So not only that, it's Passover. They're ready to get into the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a seven-day festival. And when he's brought before Pilate, what do they say? Crucify him. Now the, the high priest, it, they could have been just two high priests. There's only supposed to be one, but there are two. They could have said, crucify him, crucify him out of a thousand people. And Pilate would have said, what are the rest of you going to say? Mm -hmm. No. But he, they all said, crucify Wow, was, was Christ a reformer or a conformist? Reformer. Reformer, what happened to him? They killed him. They murdered him. <laughs> so, you can see why pastors don't want to be reformist. Right. They want to be conformist because uh, I want a big shop. I want people to come to my restaurant. Okay. Now we go to Acts 2, and just to confirm this, now this is the day of Pentecost. Well, no, you know uh, we killed we killed Christ. You know, you know I have to say no. It, it, it's it's you know people will say that. You know we killed Christ. No, they killed Christ. And and Peter's going to say that in two verse twenty two, chapter two verse twenty two. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Yahushua the Nazarene, a man pointed out of Yahweh unto you by mighty works and wonders and signs which Yahweh did through him. Who are we talking to? Ye men of Israel. Right? Through him in your midst, just as you yourself know, the same by the marked out counsel and fuller knowledge of Yahweh given up through the hands of lawless men, suspending what? You slew. You slew. Is, is is Peter a, a reformist or a conformist? Reform. He's a reformist. As we know that, and let's go to chapter 4, verse 10, or verse 8. Now we got the rulers and elders. We've got an audience with them. Then Peter, filled with holy ruach, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders. Watch this. If we this day are to be examined for doing good to a sick man, in whom this man hath been made well, be it not unto you and unto all the people of Israel, in the name of Yahushua Mashiach, the Nazarene, whom what? You crucified. Ye crucified. These are not things you should say to your congregation. <laughs> whom Yahweh awoke from among the dead, in him did this man stand by in your presence whole. And they're going to say, don't blame it on us. But you're there, you're the saying, crucify him, crucify him. You're putting the blood of this man on us. Yeah, you're going to put this yeah, blood on us, and you're like, well. So, we, what we've got to realize, we will always be a minority. It just comes that way. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. And the more you conform to this world, the more they will like you. The more you reform, the more they're not going to like you. Very, I always say very simply. I keep hearing my teacher on it. I keep saying very simply. I've got to stop that. Um, this is the way things are, period, and that's the way they've always been. So we've got to come to a realization. Don't get discouraged. And Christ says, if they hated me, what? They're going to love you? They're going to love you. No. <laughs> if they love you, then you might wonder who I'm really with. Yeah. And you know, if the world loves you, you're doing something very, very wrong. And so we've been told, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. So, good people will conform rather than reforming. We are the reformers. Take up the mantle. We need more people like that. And there's just going to be little pockets here and there and there who want actually what Yahweh has to say. And when we see uh, the Reformation... And we've been conformed to the world, and so we are being transformed by the renewing of our mind from this. But the other congregations are not. And here's just a few other examples. As we know, divorce should be handled by the church. That's 1 Corinthians 5. You should not 
if, if you have a brother who's a drunkard or a fornicator, you're not to eat with him. They shouldn't called, be in the church. Yeah, you know, that, they, that's shunning. They shouldn't be in your church. You know, so we have, you know, the dead are not alive, they're asleep. There's not a trinity, there is Yahweh, and there's a son, Yahushua, Mashiach. There is no hell, all right, but there, there, there will be um, like a fire. justice done, that the people who did evil will pay their price in full, as has been promised. There is a new, people do not go to heaven to live forever, they go to the new earth where Christ is going to reign. And so these are just a handful of things that are so foreign that most churches will never even repeat them ever, and they're always throughout this whole book. So we'll end there, and I'll have a prophecy for the people. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words. Be bold and courageous, for victory is always in front of you as you walk with me. Do not be discouraged by the darts and the arrows that come flinging at you, because they will come and they will be flung at you. But bold, stand boldly like my son did. Proclaim the truth that will set the captives free. Amen. See you next week.